It's about 1.30 in the morning on the 4th of December, 2003, here at Morton Mill in Nambour on Queensland's Sunshine Coast. Bins of sugar cane are slowly being fed into the mill, which often crushes cane around the clock. Yeah, when it's clear, I don't think there's any hurry. Tonight could be like any other for crushing cane. Keep coming. Stop. But tonight is special for these mill workers and their friends. After tonight, they won't be feeding any more sugar cane into Morton Mill. I think you can probably have a five minute break while we get photos. Tonight marks a major event here at Morton Mill. Sugar cane has been crushed here continuously for 106 years, but tonight it will receive its last bin of cane. This film looks inside the Morton Mill story at some of the people who have run the cane farms and operated the mill and will try to answer the question what will happen to the Sunshine Coast after the last crush. Today, Morton Mill is surrounded by the town of Nambour, but it wasn't always so. A sugar industry grew quickly on the Sunshine Coast and Morton Mill was built to crush its cane. This rare film shows cane being loaded by hand from a horse-drawn wagon onto a conveyor belt at Morton Mill in 1899. Nambour and the sugar cane industry would soon grow and prosper for the next 100 years. Growing and harvesting cane was back-breaking work back then. That's why, for 40 years before Federation, landowners brought South Sea Islanders to do the hard labour on sugarcane plantations up and down the Queensland coast. This is the earliest film we have of Islanders, known as Kanakas, cutting cane near Nambour in 1899. Our sugar industry in Queensland began with Kanakas cutting cane by hand. All my days I will sing in praise of my forefather's deeds on a foreign land. A small number of islanders worked on the Sunshine Coast, supplying sugar cane to the new Morton Mill. Rex Egmelis and his brother are descendants of the early cane cutters. Well, I'm the uh, 12th of the 13 children. Um, and my youngest brother Bryce and myself were the only two that never got the cut cane, but I got to work in the sugar mill. But all my brothers, every one of them cut cane. The six brothers I have were Jeff here. Um, he's uh, had a stroke, but, um, but all my brothers, my dad, yeah, the family are all cane cutters. As the mill itself expanded, so the cane land had to expand to ensure the mill remained financially viable. So the cane land stretched north and south, up into the valleys and shallow hillsides of the Sunshine Coast hinterland. And along with the new cane fields went the cane train lines, like a network of narrow gauge umbilical cords connecting the growing number of farms to Morton Mill. George Hadley is the cane rail supervisor at Morton Mill and over the past 35 years, he's seen his own changes to the cane train network. We used to have um, six or seven um, steam logos here that used to work up and down the street here. And uh, every time one would come up the street, there'd be clouds of black smoke everywhere and all the shops would be choking with, uh, with, with actual smoke in the shops themselves. And even to one stage there where we had a whole stick cane, you used to be very lucky not to get a hit in the ear with a, with a piece of cane on a truck as it come past one of the pubs or past the old Bayard store or one of those when the line was close to the footpath. Just as diesel locos have replaced steam trains, modern electronics and computers have changed control systems inside Morton Mill. But the technology for crushing and milling cane has changed very little over the years, as you can see from this educational film from 1950. The train, which belongs to the mill owner, 
brings the cane right into the mill. And here they are tipped from the trucks. Revolving knives cut the sugar cane ready for the next step, which is called shredding, and prepare the cane for crushing. These great groove rollers crush the cane and out pours the juice. Lime is added to this liquid, and it combines with anything impure, making a sludge which this rotary filter separates from the cane juice. Now to turn the cane juice into raw sugar crystals. In these huge vessels, juice is heated in a vacuum until a thick, sticky mass is formed. Brown raw sugar crystals are separated in these machines like revolving colanders called fugles. After the crystals have been dried, they are bagged. The bags are sent, you remember, by sea from the mills to the refinery in the city. Modern packaging has long since replaced the heavy jute bags of sugar, but the end result of the sugar story hasn't really changed at all. And so to the grocer and you. The story of the Morton Mill is also the story of the farming families, like Lurleen and Aussie Apps, who've spent a lifetime growing cane to support a sugar industry on the Sunshine Coast. When I came out of the army in October '45, I went straight into the cane cutting gang because manpower was short back in the war days. And I used to be that tired of a night time, I'd just about crawl home. It, it wasn't so much the cutting, it was the loading. You had to do it all by hand. There's Rowdy the horse and Ozzy and Freddie Fink up the ladder and that was, um, that was the, the little uh, trucks they had that um, ran on the portable line. Mechanisation attracted innovators from the early years of the 20th century. Anything to speed up the harvesting of cane. Like the first clunky cane harvesters, the falconer, here being put through its paces and impressing delegates of the Australian Sugar Producers Association in 1925. Morton Mill shared in the spectacular growth of Queensland sugar industry. British newsreels of the 1950s delighted in showing viewers the enormous area of caneland in Australia. Can you believe it? More than twice the length of the British Isles. Morton Mill has crushed continuously since 1897 and like all agricultural industries there have been good years and bad. One of the worst things that happened on the 1st of September 1981 at 3 o'clock in the morning was uh, the single boiler that we have virtually had a meltdown of the furnace. The uh, water ran low in the boiler, a tube blew out at the bottom of the furnace and uh, the, the fire kept on going and you know it's over a thousand degrees Celsius in the furnace and the whole lot just all the internals, all the tubes all just collapsed inwards and uh, you know with one single boiler it looked like we wouldn't crush for the remainder of the year. I can remember the chief engineer telling me that when he looked inside from the top and it's a very big furnace he wished he could have just fell in and died. <laughs> Graham Coleman was a young man in his 30s when he first came to Morton Mill in the 1970s. After a long career with Bundaberg Sugar he returned to Nambour in 2002 to manage the closure of the mill that had provided some of the most satisfying years of his career. I was very keen to make a success of, uh, of the Morton Sugar Mill. I was very keen to make a success of the whole of the Sunshine Coast sugar industry. So I worked very hard on that, was very enthusiastic and uh, wanted to see Morton Mill really reach a million tonnes of cane. But we never, we didn't get that far unfortunately. For Graham Coleman, the equation was simple. Morton Mill needs to crush a lot of cane from farms close by, because to get a high sugar content from cane, it has to be crushed as quickly as possible after it's been harvested. But as the years went by, not enough cane was being planted on land close to the mill. I think the writing's been on the wall for quite some time. 
I tried very hard uh, throughout my career here to preserve good agricultural land, especially <coughs> especially the cane growing land, preserve the existing cane growing land plus future cane growing land, keep it as agriculture. Now I worked very hard on that. The council did uh, have um, a plan in place to try to protect our land, but even so, uh, you know, since 1980 we've lost more than a thousand hectares of cane growing land to urban encroachment and other, other uses as well. While the Sunshine Coast land was attractive for growing sugarcane, it's also been attractive to people looking for a relaxed lifestyle. And there's the conflict. Encroaching urbanisation has both hemmed in and chipped away at the cane lands. On the Sunshine Coast, cane has grown mainly in the Maroochee Shire and the council has wrestled with the pressures of a growing residential region and a sugarcane industry struggling to remain viable. Over the last uh, 25 years there have been a number of reports undertaken on the Sunshine Coast sugar industry, uh, a number of them also uh, t undertaken for the Australian sugar industry and uh, by and large the outcome of each of those uh, studies has indicated that uh, for the Morton sugar growing area to be successful it needed to grow significantly in area and production. Apart from a shortage of cane lands, the rail system needed to transport cane from the farms to Morton Mill has been expensive to run. The cost of transport due to the geography of the country and our transport system is too high compared with best industry practice and uh, it's very hard to change that. Uh, in addition to uh, that new cane growing land, to get our volume up new cane growing land is some 60 to 70 kilometres away and uh, at present world prices it's very hard to justify. In the year 2000, Bundaberg Sugar, with its seven Queensland mills, was sold to a Belgian company, Finisucre, owned by the Lippens brothers. While they promised to keep all the mills running, it was only a matter of time for Morton Mill. Jeff Mitchell has spent his entire working life in the sugar industry. As the CEO of Bundaberg Sugar, he predicted the future of Morton Mill back in the 1980s. I think the time on that's been clear probably for 20 years that if world prices continued to fall and unless the increased cost issues that Morton faced as a result of, as I said, community uh, pressure on agriculture and community pressure on transport for an industrial operation, then the future was definitely uncertain. That uncertainty pointed towards a crisis. And by the year 2000, the price of sugar on the international market was half what it was 10 years previously. The crisis reached a climax in 2002. Cane farmers were notified today via a letter from Bundaberg Sugar. After this year's crush, the mill will close. Oh, this will be an absolute disaster for the Sunshine Coast hinterland. Unless the uh, growing side of the industry can find some other way of going on, uh, then that will mean that the sugar industry here on the Sunshine Coast would close down. What was inescapable reality to Bundaberg Sugar and those running Morton Mill was a sudden shock to local people and particularly the cane farming community. Everyone, including the politicians, went looking for solutions. That's a multi-million dollar industry for the Sunshine Coast. We must have the state government step in with real assistance to keep the mill operating. Aussie Apps was one of the cane farmers who wanted to buy Morton Mill and run it as a cooperative venture. I, I belong to a group of people that uh, we tried to organise the buying of the mill. I personally owned the owners, or one of the owners, over in Brussels, in Belgium, and, and he encouraged me to, uh, to uh, get the farmers together and, and, and try and talk about it, the price. They wouldn't give us a price, but, uh, and, and that sort of fell through. We didn't get enough support. 
Sunshine Coast cane growers were also encouraged to explore another proposition, using their sugar cane to make ethanol, an additive in petrol. Kevin Bailey was then head of the local cane growers organisation and he helped explore the ethanol proposal. We had a company come to us who, um, with a proposal to develop an ethanol industry here and to us at that stage it looked like it was, um, you know, if Bundaberg were going to go that was our best route to go down. So uh, we uh, went down that route and uh, you know, when we came out and made the announcement that uh, we were going to look at ethanol, well, I suppose Bundaberg took that as saying, well, the growers are not supporting us, we're going we're to close down. Here was another opportunity for the politicians to have their say. State member Peter Wellington is calling for total government support while Bundaberg Sugar considers the offer. And the last thing we want to see is the bureaucrats and the red tape kill the proposal. In our particular case, it didn't appear as though we could get enough uh, money for ethanol to make it uh, financially viable to uh, go into it. And when it finally went to the growers for a decision, they didn't support it. Bundaberg Sugar gave Morton Mill a reprieve for another season. And Maroochyshire Council kept exploring solutions to the looming mill closure, like this conference for growers, only six months before the end of the 2003 harvest. I actually opened that, opened that conference and I said it twice when I opened it, I hope today is not more lip service, where you have a, a seminar all day long and you go home feeling good, but nothing happened. I think it happened again. It's a major um, problem. We have uh, $65 million a year income from, uh, from sugar. We have 150 odd families. We have 600 people that's involved in the sugar industry. It's a major industry to stop overnight and it's a, it is a worry for us as, as planners, as council. It's a, it's a big problem. For many cane growers, it was a case of it will never happen. The owners of the largest privately owned cane farm on the Sunshine Coast, Gordon and Murray Oaks, blame growers for not taking control of their future. Yeah, the biggest thing's complacency, I think. With Queensland cane growers, we've just sat still and done nothing for too many years. Um, I think it was too good and, and the industry became complacent. Um, the industry thought it was invincible. And... Um, that's all history now. I, I feel annoyed and also sad. I feel annoyed because we weren't given enough time to find an alternative for our cane. Uh, the company to come out and, and, and buy out our mill with other mills, we can't stop them doing that. We don't deny them investing into our area, but they should have more understanding as to what's going to happen when they close the mill. I'm an old farmer myself, I can say this, that farmers are, um, are a little bit blasé. They still think tomorrow morning they'll get out of bed, they'll hop on the tractor and they'll farm their sugar cane. And one day that's not going to happen. And I just think they really haven't realised that. As the 2003 season came to an end, farmers realised that without a mill to receive their cane, their lives were about to change forever. And in the last few years we've been supplementing a bit by baling our trash and selling it for garden mulch and, and for cattle feed last year when the drought was on. But if there's no, we don't cut the cane anymore, we don't get any trash. So that, that is also out of the question as well. So uh, we don't really know what we're going to do. Oh, I think we're going to be absolutely lost. I, it's just part of us, the sugar cane. Um, at this stage we'd like to try some um, corn, the maize, um, a bit of sorghum and, um, and we might look at some um, winter barley or, or other crops like that. And, um, and, it's, and at the same time with our higher country we've diversified into pineapples. This year we look like planting 30 hectares of, of grain for human consumption uh, and weather conditions will depend on what sort of a crop we get there. Because we don't have irrigation, we depend on natural rainfall. We're going to try some, like corn and a few things like that, but I don't really think in this area is an area for that because it rains too much here. And uh, there's so many wet days in a year that uh, I don't really think it's, that that's an option, but we're certainly going to try that. Gary Rickard, like many cane growers, is at an age when most of his career is behind him, but his son Trent is not so lucky. 
Married only recently and having bought a small cane farm that's now without a mill, Trent sees a bleak future for himself. To go find a job and um, try to sell the farm or something, I don't really know what to do. We'll, we'll grow other crops yeah. to look into it a bit more. If we were able to identify a number of smaller alternative crops that could generate the same sort of income as ginger does in its area, then there would be lots of benefits for the Sunshine Coast. Well, sugarcane is probably one the, of the best uh, biofactory plants uh, currently growing, and uh, there's some very exciting stuff that's going to come along where the sugarcane plant is going to be used as a biofactory. And I think that in probably eight to ten years' time, uh, sugar will actually be the byproduct out of cane rather than being the main uh, thing that we get out of cane now. You know, it, it'll be used for a lot of other things and sugar will just be something that comes out of the process. As the 2003 cane harvest came to a close, an exciting proposal emerged that promises to see sugar cane remain on the Sunshine Coast. This humble little power plant is drying sugar cane. A wood-fired boiler is used to steam dry the cane to produce a nutrient-rich feedstock for cattle. It's a process invented in Brisbane and is already attracting interest from agricultural companies overseas. From this Bly Bly farm, these bales of tightly packed cane, or cow candy as it's called, will go into a shipping container to a customer in South Korea. A trial venture that's being watched with interest by all farmers, including the current cane growers chairman, Ross Boyle. The bio-dry process, uh, they'll be harvesting all of the cane, including uh, most of the trash, uh, the green tops and everything, and they send it to the plant where it'll be shredded and then it'll be all dried. And they won't be extracting anything, they won't be extracting any juice or molasses or, or sugar in any way. And they will then uh, take the moisture content down to around about 16%, so that's a lot less bulky to send overseas to Korea. Also, when you take the moisture out, it makes it a lot uh, more uh, durable. The product won't, uh, won't go off, it won't ferment, because it's got low, low moisture and, and a high sugar content. Sugar acts as a preservative. And it'll be baled into small bales, and uh, then they will be put into shipping containers and sent over and used in, we believe, the, the dairy industry in Korea. Like many of the 200 cane farming families on the Sunshine Coast, Ross Boyle is looking carefully at all the crop options for his land. So is there a chance that the biofeed project will keep sugarcane growing on the coast? I think at the moment it, it's the only chance of long-term sugar production on the coast unless the world's sugar price increases. There's now a big question for Sunshine Coast farmers. How long can they afford to wait while new markets for this cattle feed from sugarcane are established in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, not long. Uh, farmers at the moment are, are falling by the wayside rapidly because there's, uh, you know, there's no income coming in, and I think it, uh, it, they're going to try and get the plant up this year. And I believe that that's a very tight timeline because even when you've got uh, the council uh, happy to to help, and you've got all the governments and you've got all the politicians ready to help you, uh, it seems to take a long time. There, there always seems to be things that, that get in the road and push the timeline out. So I believe that uh, getting the biodry plant up this year is a big ask. The crackle of burning cane the dramatic yearly ritual that signals its cane harvest time on the Sunshine Coast. And like a number of rituals in 2003, it's happening for the last time. After burning, the cane is cut. Another ritual of camaraderie for cane workers. Every year I would be there to see them cut their first row. And I'm always there to see them cut the last row. So um, 
to me, that was terrific. So I'm going to miss that greatly. And the um, <coughs> cane trains that go through the bottom of my garden. Yes, I'll miss that. In future years, perhaps these will be the only images that children will have of what was once a great sugarcane industry on the Sunshine Coast. The annual sugar festival in Nambour brings the whole community together to celebrate the industry that has driven this town and this region for more than a hundred years. I'd hate to see it built up, you know, and get to the stage where everywhere you drive there's high-rise apartments and I love it. That was what attracted us to the area when we came over, you know. I'd originally seen Nambour in a, in a picture in a book and it had the sugar train going through it. We won't be able to come down and wave to the cane drivers as they <laughs> trip off down the street. It, it is a mainstay of Nambour since it's, uh, the town has grown. It's been there, that mill has been there. This has always just been part of Nambour, hasn't it? Well, for a long time. And now it's had it. I don't think it'll die, it'll lose its character, mind you. But there's a lot of people come to Nambour to see the cane train go through the street. It'll you'll lose that part of it. And the green the green paddocks and the but well, I don't think it'll really die, I don't think it's a bugger of a place to drive around in here and ever get a park, so it might be better. I don't know. <laughs> One of the biggest fears for coast residents is seeing the cane land become a sea of red roofs. Uh, we vote governments in to plan on our behalf so that we do get good planning outcomes, but in Queensland it does appear that development does drive, or developers do drive um, what happens here and uh, the planning simply plays catch up. Michael Powell is the spokesman for the Sunshine Coast Environment Council. He fears the worst excesses of urban growth, with developers constantly chasing each other to get the best foothold on coastal land. The worst that could happen to the cane land would be that uh, it was all uh, converted to high density, poorly planned urban development and or industrial development. Maruchi Shire Council is well aware of the pressure for massive urban growth into the cane lands, but it isn't sure it can stop it. Many people who come to the Sunshine Coast love coming here for the rural amenity of the sugarcane land. If that goes and is replaced by tile farming, then the outcome is not necessarily good overall for our tourism industry or the very people who like to call this their lifestyle region. It's all very well to sit on your, in your own backyard and sit, uh, having a, a barbie and a, a cool uh, drink on your patio and, think, and uh, say, well, we can't have more development. That backyard and that patio has probably been developed on land that used to be either a cow paddock or a bit of scrub. And it wasn't a cane field, I know that, but it could be in the future. Maureen Heaney is president of the Real Estate Institute on the Sunshine Coast. With the end of the cane farming, she sees an opportunity to copy the residential canal estates of the Gold Coast. Well, in the beautiful area of Twin Waters, I see cane land adjoining it, and I think that uh, it seems to flow quite well. There's precedent set um, with canal there, and um, just work, working west on the cane fields uh, along the Marushi River would seem to me to be a wise... Uh, decision. It's been done um, well everywhere in the, on the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast and many other parts of, the, of Australia. Well that would be very high on any list of the worst environmental outcomes uh, for sugarcane land uh, even if you could get the uh, insurance industry to accept liability for building on land that uh, does flood. The um, impact on the, uh, the, the rivers and um, the loss of amenity, canal developments are generally thought to be a disaster and um, they are generally um, no longer on the
on the east coast of Australia. Well, it's all great. It's always great to have a fall guy, I think. And what uh, what surprises me is that the developers are, are the fall guys, but they've been the de they've been the growth, the the foundation of growth in this area. As the debate over land use continues, the future of the hottest piece of real estate, the Morton Mill site, is still unresolved. The mill land has got to be utilised as a benefit towards to Nambour. Uh, there's been a lot of people talking about putting in another major shopping centre. That's not what we want here in Nambour. We don't want to split the town. I would like to see, and it's, it is my dream, that we can utilise that area there towards transit centre, towards entertainment, towards uh, convention centre and also towards accommodation. Bundaberg Sugar have uh, responded to a number of interests to purchase over the last two years that I've had some involvement with the sugar industry transition. Uh, they have consistently been unclear in the receipt of uh, offers of sale or offers of purchase rather. We have certainly uh, made it clear for uh, perhaps a year now that it is our objective as a company to in fact sell in one way or another all of the land that we own in the Morton area. We only own land uh, from the point of view of the operation of a sugar mill and if that's not viable then that won't continue. The last siren sounds to mark the last day shift at Morton Mill and one of the most important last jobs here is the lighting of the mill boiler. Rodney Coombs has been a mill worker here for 17 years and today he will fire up the boiler for the last time. Well normally we, um, we've got to put some, the gas into the furnace to, for the ignition. I'm just opening it up to see, to see what, uh, what the state of the, the, the uh, furnace is before I start up. I'm just going to get me torch. There's a fair bit of heat already in the, in the, you can feel the heat coming out. This will probably self-ignite, it probably won't actually have to light it this time. Okay, the first thing I do is get one of the big fans going. That's the oil, I'm just making sure that the oil pump's going for the, for the ID, the ID fan. Make sure the flaps are shut. Takes us four hours to raise steam with the normal light up. And we use the, if it's a normal Monday morning light up, we get here at four o'clock in the morning for an eight o'clock start. So Rodney, what does it feel like? Was this the last time for you? Well, it's a bit disappointing. <laughs> Would have liked to see it go a lot further, actually. So it was a sad day? Very sad. Yeah, okay, we'll go down and start the, start the pony motor up. We're just here for emergency sake, really. If something goes wrong, most of the time it runs automatically pretty well. But we blow a tube or whatever you know, problems you have, that's what we get paid for. On this last day, Rodney expresses the feelings that are going through the minds of most of the Morton Mill workers. I'm not ready for retirement yet. <laughs> and being, you know, all our family settled around here. I hope we don't have to move away actually to, to um, you know, to get another job. I can still work around the area somewhere. Besides Rodney, other mill workers on this last day are feeling exactly the same way. Rather sad. Um, I've been here seven years. Um, so, mixed emotions, but sad to see it all end. Oh, it's sad. Um, there's a lot of history associated with the place. Uh, I was a bit, a bit sad in one respect, I suppose, but uh, life goes on. Local residents felt the sadness too. All through the day they came by the site to take photos, realising that history was being made. So, it's passing of an era. Worse luck. There'll be a lot of heartache and there'll be a lot of sadness about it uh, because it is the end of an era, but uh, Nambour will keep going. Nambour will go on to bigger and better things, I think. 
Back inside the mill, Graham Coleman was preparing to vacate the desk that he'd first occupied more than 25 years ago. Graham Coleman was um, about 34 years of age when he first came here. Uh, he had black hair those days and um, I think, uh, you know, I'm like the sugar industry on the Sunshine Coast, uh, I will have reached uh, the end of my viable <laughs> working life probably by the time the site is cleared. The last bin of sugarcane at Morton Mill is in place, but there's a reluctance to tip it. The few people here know they're witnessing an important milestone in their lives. The last page turns in the fascinating story of Morton Mill and the sugar industry on the Sunshine Coast. See that day.